All right, Chemistry 111, this is more review for our final exam. We're going to finish it up now, and we're going to start with question number 62. And it says, given an equation, determine the energy released for a specific amount of reactant. And the equation in, um, that we're interested in is this one right here. It says <clears throat> methane plus four moles of chlorine gives you carbon tetrachloride and four moles of HCl. And then it gives us the delta H, right? The change in enthalpy for the reaction. It's an exothermic reaction because our delta H is negative. And the question is based on the above reaction, what energy changes when 9.23 grams of methane reacts? What I want you to understand is that this delta H value, so it says delta H is negative 434 kilojoules. Now that is per what? Well, when it comes to my methane here, there's one mole of methane, right? So that's for one mole of methane. Okay, that same negative 434 kilojoules, that's per four moles of chlorine. Not important for this question, but I want you to understand that, right? For four moles of chlorine. It's equal to negative 434 kilojoules for my one mole of carbon tetrachloride, one mole of CCL4. And it's negative 434 kilojoules for my four moles of HCl. So again, I can't stress this enough that this delta H value right here is for this specific reaction. Okay, now the only one of these conversion factors that we're going to need is this one right here because we're talking about 9.23 grams of methane. Now, is 9.23 grams of methane a mole? The answer is no. If you just tally up the molar mass of methane quickly in your head, carbon weighs 12 and hydrogen weighs 1. So 12 plus 4 gives you 16. So it's definitely not a mole. All right, so that means our delta H is going to be less for 9.23 grams of methane. And I think one of the best ways to solve this problem is to use dimensional analysis. So if we start it with our 9.23 grams of methane and we convert that to the number of moles of methane using the molar mass of methane. So one mole of methane, and I, I've already gone ahead and tallied this up. It's 16. I got 16.05 grams, oops, grams per mole for my methane. So anyhow, 16.05 grams of methane. If we were to stop right here, we would simply have the number of moles of methane. But I can use the conversion factor that's inside the yellow box, Scanta. I can use the fact that for every one mole of methane that reacts, I release negative 400, or I release 434 kilojoules of energy. Now the mole units cancel out and I'm left over with the amount of energy that's released when you burn, or sorry, when you react 9.23 grams of methane in the presence of chlorine to make carbon tetrachloride. When we punch all that spinach into our calculator, we get negative 250, three sig figs, kilojoules. And so that's the total amount of um, heat energy released in this reaction. All right, let's do another question that involves um, enthalpy. Question 63 says, given the heats of formation for reactants and products, determine the heat of reaction. This is the equation, or sorry, the reaction that we're interested in, this one down here. And we're, all, we're given all of these um, standard heats of formation. So these are all standard heats of formation for tetraphosphorus, uh, deck oxide, water, and phosphoric, um, uh, phosphoric acid in the solid form. Anyhow. The equation that you need to know here is that the delta H of this reaction is going to be equal to the sum of the delta H's of the products minus the sum of the delta H's of the reactants. And of course, if there's a stoichiometric coefficient, like a 6 or a 4, you're going to have to include that. Now, I left it out of this equation here. But if you think about this equation, why would it be products? minus reactants, because you're taking these heats of formation, right? You're forming. So if you're taking product, and there's only one product, which is phosphoric acid, you're just leaving it the way it is, right? Because when you form phosphoric acid, you're going to release that much heat for every mole. Okay, fine. Now, why would we subtract the delta H of formation of our reactants? The reason why is because you're basically changing the sign, right? You're subtracting you know, a negative, right? So you're not 
forming those, you're breaking them apart. Okay, so that's kind of the mindset that you want to have when you're, you know, using this formula. Well, now it's just a matter of plugging some values in. So we're going to have that our delta H of this reaction is going to be equal to um, the delta H of formation of the um, product, which is the phosphoric acid, H3PO4. We have four moles of that. So we'll put four times negative 1279 kilojoules per mole. We'll put that in brackets and then we're going to subtract the sum of the delta e, delta H is a formation of both um, tetraphosphorus decoxide, negative 3110 kilojoules per mole, plus the delta H of formation of the water. And there's six moles of that. So six times um, 286 kilojoules per mole. Put that in brackets like that. And when you tally all that up, and I've already gone ahead and done it, you get that the delta H of the reaction is equal to negative 5,116 kilojoules per mole. Subtract negative 4,826 kilojoules per mole. And then we get that our delta H of reaction is equal to negative 290 kilojoules per mole, just like that. So it's just a matter of, you know, knowing when to apply this formula and knowing how to use, you know, the formula to determine the delta H of reaction when you're given heats of formation. All right. Well, let's take a look at number 64. It says use Hess's law to determine the delta H of a reaction. Remember that according to Hess's law, delta H is a state function, right? The route that we take to get there is not important. All that's important is that when we add up these reactions that are provided here with all these different delta H values that we're going to end up with this net equation right here. Now, how would I manipulate these three equations? I'm going to call them equation one, two, and three. Well, if I take a close look at these, um, now, I'm just kind of looking at it overall, you know, the big picture here and kind of manipulating it in my mind. Um, and what I see is that we have, you know, two C's. Right now, we have two C's here, and we don't have two C's anywhere else here at all. Okay, so that means we're going to have to leave the first equation as is. So I'm just going to rewrite it. 3B plus, or sorry, 3B can't even make the letter B. 3B produces two moles of C plus D. And then we'll put our delta H value up here. It's in kilojoules per mole. And we'll write that down. So it's negative 125. Okay, so I kind of have this guy taken care of. The next thing that I notice is that the only place that I have E is right here, right? And E is a product. So what does that mean? I'm going to have to reverse this entire equation. So that means I have to multiply it by negative 1. Now I'm going to reverse the equation, but when I multiply by negative one, instead of having 350 kilojoules per mole as my delta H of the reaction, I'm going to have negative 350. Let me show you. So I'm going to have negative 350 when I reverse that reaction. So D is going to produce um, E plus A. Okay, there we go. Now we have one equation left. Now, something else that I notice is that there's no A in here, right? There's no A in here to speak of, and there's no D as well. So I'm going to have to remove the A. Now, the, the D is already going to be eliminated, right? But I have to get rid of that A. So in order to get rid of the A, I'd have to multiply this by 2, because a half times 2 gives you 1, and I need to have 1A on the reactant side. So if I take that equation and I multiply it by 2, I get A produces 2B like that. Then I take 150 and I multiply it by 2, and I get 300, 300, like that. Now, if I tally those reactions up, we already canceled the D. You can see that A is also going to cancel. And something else that's kind of interesting is you're going to lose the two Bs over here, but you're only going to lose two of the Bs here, so you're going to be left with one. There's going to be one B left over, right? Three minus two gives you one. So our net reaction is going to be B produces E plus 2C, E plus 2C. That means all I have to do is tally these up. So I get negative 475 plus 300, which gives me negative 175 
kilojoules per mole. Something to think or something to keep in mind when you apply Hess's law, you don't even have to do this reaction in order to, to determine the change in enthalpy for that reaction, right? You can use these other reactions in order to calculate that. And that's because delta H is a state function. Number 65 is more of just an FYI. It says, you know, have a conceptual understanding of what happens during a physical change. Intermolecular forces are broken. However, intramolecular forces or bonds are not broken. An example of what she's getting at here is let's say you took water, you know, in the liquid phase and you convert it to steam, right? Water in the gaseous phase. Well, it's still water. You still, you're starting with water H2O and you're still ending up with H2O. You did not break any of the covalent bonds. What's the only thing that gets broken here? You are going to only break IMFs, intermolecular forces, right? Another example would be, what if we took water in the solid phase and we melted it, right? It's still water. It's just, we're only changing um, or we're only um, uh, breaking intermolecular forces, right? We're not changing any of the intramolecular forces or the bonds whatsoever. So not, never, ever bonds. All right, number 66, given a reaction, determine whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. Well, here, if we're going from a liquid to a gas, we're going from bromine in its natural state, which is a liquid, and then we're converting it to a gas, that means we're going to have to apply heat, aren't we? Okay. And if we're going to have to apply heat, then this is an endothermic reaction, right? An exothermic reaction is one that releases heat. Okay. And this is one where we have to apply heat. So this must be an endothermic reaction, right? Now, why is it an endothermic reaction? Well, it says here endothermic because bond breaking releases energy or because bond breaking requires energy. Now, the best answer is this one here, but I would be a little bit careful on her wording, which I don't think is the greatest, okay? Because we're not breaking bonds here, right? I would say um, IMF breaking, right? We're breaking the intermolecular forces between the bromine molecules, okay? In the liquid phase, and then we're spacing them out. So this is endothermic because it requires energy, right? You're going to um, uh, break those um, London forces, right, between uh, nonpolar molecules. Okay, here's something a little bit different. We're going to cal calculate um, delta H of a reaction here. So it says calculate the enthalpy change. So that means we're calculating delta H for this reaction. Two carbon monoxides plus oxygen gives you two CO2 given the following bond energies. So when you are asked to calculate delta H using bond energies, it's a little bit different. So when you're asked to calculate delta H of a reaction, okay, using bond energies, it's going to be the sum of the bond energies of the reactants subtract the sum of the bond energies of the products. Okay, now if you think about this, okay, if I'm taking the sum of the bond energies of the reactants, okay, what I'm doing is, here are my reactants, it's what, um, sorry, I can hardly see here, carbon monoxide, anyhow, it's kind of hard to see from, from these because you don't have the whole thing, but anyhow, right, if I'm taking the bond energies of the reactants, that means these are a measure of the amount of energy it takes to break those apart. Right. If I want to break a carbon-oxygen triple bond, I have to put in 1,074 kilojoules of energy for every mole. Right. So it stands to reason that you wouldn't change the sign of this to break that apart. That tells you how much energy you need. Right. So my delta H of the reaction is going to start like this: two moles of carbon monoxide. So it's going to be two times 1074 kilojoules per mole. Okay. Plus one times 499 kilojoules per mole, right? That's the amount of energy it takes to break apart the O2 molecule. And then we're going to subtract, right? Because now we're going to release energy when we form the products. But how many times are we going to have this carbon-oxygen double bond? Well, remember that CO2 has two carbon-oxygen double bonds, and you've got a total of two molecules of CO2, right? I'm drawing them out over here. 
That means you've got one, two, three, four, four times that bond energy. All right, or that, um, yeah, bond energy. So 802 kilojoules per mole. There we go. So we got everything plugged into our um, equation here. So I worked that out. You know, I like to do it kind of stepwise to make sure I don't make too many mistakes. At 26, 47, 47 kilojoules per mole um, plus negative 3,200 kilojoules per mole. And that gives you a delta H for this reaction as being five, negative 561 kilojoules per mole. Okay, I can't stress this enough, you guys. Let me just show you one more thing before we, you know, get closer to the end here, right? This formula is when we use bond energies, right? And it's reactants minus products, okay? This formula that we used up here was products minus reactants. And that's when we used the delta H is a formation. Think about formation, energy is released. Bond energy, you got to put bond, you got to put energy in to break it. So they're opposites of each other. Another thing you want to think about, and I'll, I don't think this is going to be hassed on the exam, but if you calculate the delta H of a reaction using delta heats of formation, it's going to be more accurate than if you calculate it using bond energies, because bond energies are just averages, right? This carbon-oxygen double bond, that's just an average from many different molecules. Whereas these delta H's of formation here, these are precise values for these specific molecules. Anyhow, just something to think about. Okay, the last question, and this will wrap it up. It says, given a series of measurements, determine whether the results are precise or accurate. Uh, let's see here. Um, the density of a substance is 0 .6, 0 0.6315 grams per milliliter. A student did three measurements and obtained the following results. 0 0.6115 grams per milliliter, 0 0.7251 grams per milliliter, and 0 0.6523 grams per milliliter. Which term best describes the measurements? So I'll give you a second to look at it. So first, let's clarify what precision and accuracy are, right? So accuracy, okay, so accuracy would be closeness, closeness to accepted value. This is the quickest definition I can give you, okay? Whereas precision would be agreement, agreement amongst amongst measurements or closeness between measurements. Okay, maybe that would have been better. All right, anyhow. Well, you can see that these definitely aren't precise, are they, right? There's very little agreement here. We go from 0.61 all the way up to 0.72 and back down to 0.653. So I would say it's definitely not precise. So I would, you know, kind of negate those ones there. And then I went and I calculated the average of the three of them. So I calculated the average, average is, come on, the average is, what did I get? 0 0.6630 grams per milliliter. I mean, that's not close to this either. You know, I'd say that's pretty far off. So I would say that this is, these, these values are neither precise nor accurate. They're kind of all over the place. You'd want to be a lot closer in order to call these is being um, accurate measurements.